Hello, I'm David Penn, Research Analyst with Finnovate. We're here at Finnovate Spring 2022 in San Francisco, California. And joining me is Ian Khan. He is a future readiness pioneer and author. He's fresh off the stage from his keynote. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that he talked about on stage to our audience here at Finnovate Spring, as well as some of his thoughts about what we all should be thinking about headed forward. Ian, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, David. Sure. So let's just start off with you telling us a little bit about yourself and some of the work that you did. Of course. So I'm a technology futurist and an educator. Uh, I'm also a documentary filmmaker, author, so there's many, many things that I, I, I do as part of my work, <laughs> but all of it is really um, focused on educating industries on the impact of emerging technology, what is coming down the pipeline, what do the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years look like, mm -hmm. and what can you do to be future ready? What can your organization, your clients, your audience, your any anybody that you touch can do to make the world a better place by becoming future ready? In, in many ways. So a lot is happening in technology, mm -hmm. but I really believe that it's not the only thing that organizations need to look at mm. in terms of creating value. There's many other things to be done. No, it's interesting. I want to uh, get a chance to talk a little bit more about that. I also admit that I really appreciate the way that you use the phrase future ready as opposed to one of the phrases I've heard quite commonly in financial services and in fintech of future proofing as a future, the future needs to be something to be guarded against mm. as opposed to be mm -hmm. ready for. So I really appreciate the way that you phrase it compared to the way I think a lot of people have. And there's a reason for that. Mm. I, I, I'm, I'm opposed to using the term future proof as well because future proofing sounds like uh, you're going to have to seal yourself off from change, mm -hmm. right? And we cannot do that. The only thing that's permanent is change. Industries will change, people will change, economies will change, right? Business will change. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to work with the times and these changes rather than stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, leaders and organizations that want to stop that change do not have a good future in my opinion. So let's learn how to work with change and use it to our advantage mm -hmm. to create more value and to do whatever incredible things you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. So again, you're uh, again just fresh off the stage from your keynote and it was a uh, title, The Future's View of the Next 25 Years in Fintech. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe you could share some of the key points or key takeaways from your presentation. So my session was packed with a lot mm -hmm. of different things and what I wanted to do is challenge the audiences on thinking beyond their organization, whether mm. it was a bank, a credit union, uh, a vendor, a technology partner. Mm. I wanted them to leave their organization right here in the room and think about the world outside of their organization mm. because that's what is impacting what they do here. In my opinion, it's sure. important to understand the broader changes that are happening in the world, what is happening in other circles, other industries, mm -hmm. because as leaders and as critical thinkers and innovators, we have to think of the world beyond the four walls in which we work every single day, mm -hmm. right? In within organizations, you're bogged down with everyday challenges, everyday problems uh, and issues that, 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 that don't let you think about greater things. And so that was what my session was all about. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about uh, emerging technology, of course, we talked about, uh, I, I covered a little bit of uh, blockchain, a little bit of AI, Web3, uh, the metaverse, mm. and what these things mean and why uh, the attendees should look into them and what they should investigate and why they should find relevance to their organizations and businesses and, or, and uh, entities and, and connect them with the change these things are creating. Now, the customer is being impacted by all of these things, Absolutely. right? The customer is being impacted. So it's, it, it has to be a, a, a point that leaders and organizations look into and think about. And so that was what the session was all about. A shaker, a stirrer of the pot, <laughs> uh, just, to, just to get some uh, thinking going. Yeah, it's really interesting. It seems to be one of the common themes I'm hearing, obviously from yourself and hearing from other folks, about the importance of getting beyond that organization. And I think of so many different ways that that's come across, whether it's because of remote work, whether it's because of some of the things that people have to think about as a result of the pandemic in terms of now childcare isn't just a, a social issue. It's something that everybody has to think about because your workers are in different places from where they used to be. Um, so it's really interesting to hear you talk about the importance and the, the value of looking outside your organization. There's one thing also that I noted. Uh, you created something called the Future Readiness Score. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that and why you created it and what it helps us do? Of course. So the Future Readiness Score is a metric to measure how ready an organization is for the future, mm -hmm. right? This metric doesn't exist. 
Uh, and we have a lot of incredible consulting firms and organizations that do great work in the world, but a metric to measure future readiness doesn't exist. So we're the first ones to do it. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's something we've been working on for the last five years. Yeah. Uh, what we've concluded after looking into 250 different studies, independent studies that have been done, we've looked at all the work that everybody's doing in terms of consulting firms, the big four and mm -hmm. so on. And we've tried to find a way to quantify how an organization can say with one number, with one metric, that we're so much ready for the future, right? Hmm. Ask anybody today, how ready are you for the future? And they'll talk about technology, right. right? Oh, we're doing AI and we're looking into blockchain, but how did we ever come to the conclusion that future readiness is all about technology, right? Hmm. We know organizations, banks, financial institutions, everybody, every industry is facing challenges with employees. Yes. They're facing challenges with retention. They're facing challenges with engagement and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And so we took seven different uh, pillars of uh, impact and uh, put them all together, mm -hmm. created uh, a, a certain framework uh, of, of an assessment that organizational leaders can do, organizations can do, participants do, mm -hmm. and the results are displayed as your future readiness score. Mm -hmm. And that score can be tracked year on year uh, because maybe the changes that you incorporate in your business change right. and you do things, some things you don't do. And if you take that score again next year or after a certain period of time, your, your ranking changes. Mm. And so it's a tracker okay. for future readiness and how anti or, or let's say how disruption proof is your business, right? Mm. Disruption is happening in many different ways. Look at the great resignation. It's a disruptive <laughs> event Very. for many different organizations and industries. Mm -hmm. And so we measure all those things and, and give industries uh, a number, one number they can track. Yeah, very interesting. Now you talk, uh, or your work is, uh, relates to a, a wide variety of industries, a variety of sectors, things like that. But I think a lot of the folks who listen to this are pretty curious about one sector in particular, and it's financial services. And I'm curious, how do financial services companies, maybe in, in general, and maybe if you want to break that down and aggregate that a little bit, um, how do they fare when it comes to future readiness, generally speaking? So if you look at organ financial services, I mean, we have the entire we have to think about uh, the environment. Are we talking about worldwide? Are we talking mm -hmm. about North America, Europe? So there's many differences in how things are happening sure. everywhere. Um, we heard during the conference in many of the sessions that uh, the US is lacking behind adoption mm -hmm. and Europe is far ahead and digital payments are here and, and all these things are happening. Mm -hmm. So there's no uniform uh, kind of a situation where we can say the entire global industry is here. Right. However, if we were to kind of quantify that, Globally, generally as an industry, the financial service industry is always slower to adapt to technology sure. because of many different reasons. Because first of all, it's time consuming, it's an investment, and mm -hmm. you can't just flip things overnight and invest in something and then it doesn't work out. So that's quite understood. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, digital currencies, digital payments, blockchain powered technologies, mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies, NFTs, tokenization, these are all new things right. that we hear every day. And I really believe these are change makers that will create faster change hmm. in, in a shorter amount of time in the future, right? Mm -hmm. It's taken us, what, 150 years to be here, kind of in the financial sure. sector with money and currency and fiat uh, and creating the processes and the systems we have. But these new things that are talking about democratization, uh, digitization, they will happen faster. In mm. the next five to seven to 10 years, maybe there'll be a regulation on digital currencies, mm. there'll be systems and processes that'll help us govern all of that. So banks and institutions have to kind of keep that in mind that future change is happening faster. And unless we don't look at ways of adapting and moving faster and investigating and going out there, things might not look very favorable, right? Mm. Because there, there are certain institutions that are moving faster, the consumer is moving faster, Definitely. adoption is moving into different ways. I'll give you a, a, a very simple example is uh, of even banks having an app. There are many banks who are still mm -hmm. struggling to have an app that does everything, mm -hmm. uh, that has a dashboard for their customers, that gives the client no reason to come into the branch. Yeah. But with the pandemic, yes, many of them invested in that and, and they're reaping the benefits. So I think it's also smaller journeys mm -hmm. rather than investing you know, everything you've got into one thing. Uh, it's time to, to change the way you're doing things 
Otherwise, change will catch up to you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Speaking of change, one of the things that's uh, got a, a lot of attention from folks uh, in financial services and out is the metaverse, or mm -hmm. omniverse, people are talking about it now. Um, uh, a colleague was remarking to me the other day that uh, there was a particular dem demonstration, and the demonstration to all effects looked like a metaverse t type of, of, uh, of application, yet the person uh, doing the demo never used the word. Um, and he thought that was kind of an interesting thing, given that it's such a catchphrase. So I'm curious, in terms of where you stand from what you see, what does the metaverse mean to us? What potentials are there? What, how should we understand it, do you think, most constructively? Of course. Uh, so I'm writing a book called The Metaverse for Dummies. Oh. It will be out <laughs> in uh, early next year. Okay. Uh, and I'm creating some content for LinkedIn. Uh, Securing the Metaverse is a course that's coming out towards the end of the year on LinkedIn, designed by me, and I'm, I'm, I'm the one who's uh, running it. Um, so I can, I can tell, talk a little bit about the metaverse. Uh, the metaverse essentially is another channel. Mm. It is a channel to reach a demographic, a targeted customer who's on the metaverse, right? Okay. Uh, a metaverse is a, is a 3D world that can be accessed, say, with virtual reality hardware, virtual mm. reality glasses, augmented reality glasses, and there's many of them on the market today. Mm -hmm. Magic Leap has one, Quest 2 by Facebook or Meta, uh, and m many other companies have these new uh, glasses. And so what is happening is that over the past 10 years, the improvements that are being made or that have been made in hardware, specifically graphics cards, mm. and the way they can display the resolution that, that we can see now. Mm -hmm. For example, we have 4K uh, TVs now, right? right? 10 years ago, 4K wasn't there, right. but now we also have 8K TVs that are coming to the market that are super expensive. Mm -hmm. We're not buying them yet, but they're, they're out there. Right. So resolution has changed. In a similar way, graphics cards and this entire development of virtual reality has changed how clearly we can see things, mm -hmm. right? On the other hand, the gaming industry has come together with this a change in resolution and hardware, and now gamers have incredible experiences within games. Right. And guess what else is happening? Cryptocurrencies are happening. Mm. Something called non-fungible tokens are happening, where mm. now as a gamer, I can go into a game and buy my avatar, my character, some virtual goods, maybe I can buy a shield, a sword, or maybe a, a branded Balenciaga uh, shoes because it's available on that gaming world. Mm. And all these worlds together, different worlds, and there's many gaming worlds available and non-gaming virtual worlds, mm. they all are collectively called the metaverse, right? Okay. It's like the internet. The internet is YouTube, the internet is email, the internet is communicate. it's everything together. Mm. And that's what the metaverse is. So we're going to see different types of metaverses emerging. Mm. Right now, there's a lot of focus on gaming. Right. But uh, there's a lot of focus also uh, rising on buying land on the metaverse. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting times for a virtual world which has a very specific audience and a demographic. And I think from a financial service perspective, banks need to think of it as another channel to reach their customers and to serve them. Oh, very interesting. I haven't heard of it referred to as a channel before, but that's very clarifying when you, when, you, when you explain it that way. I thought maybe by wrapping up, we could talk a little bit about the potential for or for surprises, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, are there things that you see from your perspective, from the work that you do, that are maybe uh, potentially coming down the pike that you don't think a lot of people are paying attention to or even aware could happen to them? Or do you have a sense that people are doing a better job of, of tracking potential developments, things that are in very, very nascent forms that may or may not come to fruition? I think there's so much information available out there mm -hmm. that if you were to sit and focus, you will find what you're looking for, yeah, right? Okay. Uh, so that's the truth of the era that we're living in. Right. Everything is out there with digital internet properties, magazines, mm -hmm. video channels, like, like Informa has tons of content out sure. there. Mm -hmm. Great. The, the problem is we know where the content is, we know where the information is, but how much initiative do people, leaders, individual contributors out there take mm -hmm. on finding out what's going on mm -hmm. and then actioning that? Mm -hmm. That's where the challenge is. I think people are waiting for others to take action. They're waiting okay. for their boss to tell them, hey, go and find that out. And we have to make ourselves uh, a little bit louder hmm. and voice our opinion and talk about things that can make the world, a better, uh, the world a better place. Your community, your bank, your organization, your financial institution, you can, how, how can you serve your customers better? Hmm. You see some leaders within the space taking really innovative steps. You have um, Chase Bank as an example that has a, a bank or a branch on the metaverse. Now, right. <laughs> will all of their customers go on the metaverse and withdraw funds? 
No, they will not. Right. And they also have a tiger that walks by that branch, by the way, a virtual <laughs> tiger. Huh. But the amount of PR the amount of outreach, mm. the amount of connection they have now made with everybody on the metaverse who's thinking about banking, who's potentially the future customer, that's what it's all about, right? So mm. it's about thinking differently, thinking as an innovator, and doing things rather than just waiting and being extremely risk averse. So I think we have to act rather than wait, and that's the one step that we need to do. Oh, very interesting. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, the fascinating presentation on the main stage. A great conversation here. A lot of things that you've brought up. Uh, we're looking forward to the book coming out. Um, I know there's a book that is already out that uh, uh, you're doing some signings here at the show for folks who are uh, who might be watching, who might have the opportunity to pick that up. So that's fantastic for people to get a little more about what the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for joining us as well.